Hi everybody, I'm Chris. And I'm Matt. We own and operate Drupal Guitars in Northwest Florida, where we build custom, handmade acoustic and electric guitars. And we have our own YouTube channel, where we make videos about all the cool stuff we do in our shop. When the folks at Stumac called the Stumac to see if we wanted to collaborate on a video series about guitar finishing. We've been watching Stumac videos forever. We were like, yeah, let's do it. So we packed up our gear and we traveled from our shop to the Stumac headquarters with the mission to shoot a video series about one of the biggest questions new guitar makers and kit builders ask. Is it really possible to get a great looking, pro quality finish on a guitar using only aerosol spray cans? Spoiler alert friends, it can be done. <laughs> Let's go do it. In this three part series, we're gonna show you step by step, mix this really, really good, how to get a professional quality guitar finish nice job. on your very first try. Hang on. <laughs> right at home. It's so level and flat. It just takes a little patience, proper technique, and an area to spray, which for us is the rooftop of Stumac. So let's hope it doesn't rain, and let's get to it. Chances are you're watching this series for one of two reasons. Either you're building a new guitar, whether from scratch or from a kit, that is currently at the stage that we luthiers call in the white. The major construction is complete, but it's just bare wood. And you're looking to apply an original finish. Yours at home will look like this if it's in the white. Or you're here because you're looking to refinish an old guitar. Maybe you don't like the color of it, or it's got a scratch or a ding, or maybe you started a band and you guys want to have all matching instruments. Either way, you've come to the right place. Because for both jobs, most of the finishing process is the same. There are just a few extra prep steps on a refinish. Finishing can get a lot more complicated when we're talking about things like staining the wood or doing multi-color sunbursts or even metallic finishes. So for the sake of simplicity, in this video series, we're gonna be doing a single one color opaque finish. The main model we'll be working with is the kit guitar that we have here. It is a Strat style kit that Stumac sells. And it's a great example of what a guitar looks like when it's in the white. When the process deviates for a refinish, we're gonna pop into our studio in Florida with this white Epiphone so that everyone can follow along throughout the whole series and end up with an incredibly good finish. For me, I had to learn all of this stuff the hard way over years and years of messing up over and over again. But our goal with this video series is to get you to skip the trial and error part. Learn from our mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, if you stick with the techniques we're gonna show you, you're gonna end up with a completely amazing professional finish on your first attempt. I promise you, it'll be good. Okay, before we dive in, let's go over the general steps of any finishing project so that you, we can see the full picture from start to finish. What we're gonna do is have my trusty assistant, Matt, <laughs> write those steps down on the whiteboard. Remembering that he is left-handed and a horrible writer, so don't mind that internet. Spelling, whatever, <laughs> who cares, right? The first thing that we need to do is sand the guitar. We'll get rid of any raised imperfections in the wood, as well as old paint if you're doing a refinish. Essentially prepping it to receive what is step number two, and that's called the pour fill. We're gonna fill in any wood pores and any other tiny divots to ensure it's a completely level surface. That way the lacquer doesn't shrink back and cause any small little imperfections in the finish. The third step is applying what's called a vinyl sealer to the guitar. And that actually seals that pore filling and the wood so that it accepts the color coat a lot better, which leads us to step number four, applying the color. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? Once that is dry, we're gonna do step five, and that is the clear coats. The clear coats is the most time intensive and complicated part of this, and it is a multi-day, multi-step process. Step number six, we're gonna do what's called wet sanding, using sandpaper and leveling it all out to get it perfectly smooth in preparation for the final step where the big payoff is, and that is the buff out. And that's the part where you get rewarded with that glassy, smooth, gloss look to your guitar, like you bought it at a music store. We want to encourage you to stick with us in this first episode because we're going to be covering some of the most critical items in the finishing process. The prep sand, the pour fill, followed by the vinyl sealer. The goal of all of these steps is to prep the wood to create as smooth and flat of a surface as possible. Be prepared to spend time on these steps and pay attention to the details. You are pouring a literal foundation here that everything's gonna get stacked on top of, whether it's the pour fill or the vinyl seal or the color or the clear coat. And if you can start off with a flatter surface now, 
you're going to be much more successful on the back end. Matt knows this, if you don't take your time on these first few steps, you're going to make up that time on the back end. Yeah. Right. Do the work now or do it later, That's but right. you're better off doing it now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> In the finishing process, there's an important thing called the finishing schedule. And you need something, whether it's a whiteboard or a piece of paper or a journal, to keep track of every step that you've done so that you'll know how many coats you've applied and how much time has elapsed between each step. That's going to be incredibly important to help you guys achieve the finish that you're looking for. So with that, let's get into that prep work. Before we sand, we're gonna to need to go over the neck and the body on the guitar and make sure that there are no defects in it that need repairing. If you've built your guitar from scratch, I promise you there's probably some small dents that you don't even notice until you get to this point. And that's just from banging it around in the shop. If you're working on a kick guitar like we've got here, it comes out of the box looking like it is fully prepped. I mean, to the naked eye, you look at this and go, oh cool, I can just apply finish. But what I wanna challenge you to do is to really take your time and look at this guitar and ask yourself, do I have any opportunities to make this a little bit smoother or a little bit better? Because remember, this is our last opportunity to fix any issues with the wood before we start applying finish. A lot of times there's gonna be small spots on it that need a little bit more sanding, and sometimes there can be dents. After looking at this one, I feel like it is ready to go. But if you do find a dent that's not the end of the world, to prove to you that it's no big deal, we're gonna have Matt hit this perfectly good guitar with a hammer. So with that, let's see what he can do. Do the honors. <laughs> you do it. Oh God, <laughs> that's brutal. I didn't like that at all, by the way. <laughs> the first thing you wanna do when analyzing a dent is to realize whether or not you have broken wood fibers in it or not. Broken fibers often require a filler of some sort, which I'm gonna get into a little bit later in this episode. But if you're lucky, the dent will be nice and smooth, and you can use heat and steam to rise the wood back to the surface. And that's exactly what we have here. A lot of luthiers use a soldering iron for this job, but and what I use is an actual household iron and some shop towels. It's important that the towel or cloth that you use is lint-free and doesn't have any sort of dyes or stains in it, as well as any like soaps or chemicals that can leach onto your wood. Now don't put any water in the iron, leave it dry. Instead, we're gonna get our moisture either from a spray bottle filled with distilled water, or you can use purified water in a cup too. What's the importance of distilled? Yeah, the reason you don't wanna use anything other than distilled water or pure water is because you can actually stain the wood with impurities that are in the water, like chlorines and different chemicals. So, what you're gonna do is preheat your iron to the highest temperature that you can, and I will apply a little bit of water to the corner of the towel and place it on top of the dent, and then carefully iron. I'm not applying much pressure, and you'll notice that I have just the toe of it into that dent. I'm not laying it totally flat because I don't wanna accidentally heat up a section of the body that I'm not trying to repair. You just wanna cook until well done. <laughs> Iron for about five to seven seconds, and then check it. It's not quite flush, so I'm gonna do a little bit more. The quicker you address the dent after it happens, the easier it is gonna to be to fix. So don't wait. Now I'm gonna flip the towel over and iron on the dry side just for a few seconds. And that'll dry that moisture out of it. Nice job. <laughs> This is looking pretty flush to the surface, but let's just give it a minute to dry and we're gonna check back again. Now that we've given this a little bit of time to ensure that it's completely dry, if I rub my hand on here, this is smooth, and the moment that I get to the area where I did the steam out, the grain is just slightly raised. So the next step is to use this 220 grit sandpaper. You can use either finer or a little bit coarser if you'd like to. I wouldn't go any more coarse than 180. With a nice little foam hard block, and all we're gonna do is very lightly sand the top just like this, just to knock down any of those little high fibers that we have on there. And that's totally smooth, like it never even happened. That's a relief. But if your dent's still there, don't be afraid to fire that iron back up again. Usually the wood will take about four applications of that steam and slowly release that dent. You're gonna get less and less results from it the more you steam it, but if you're not able to get it out on the first try, you can do it again. Just be cautious if you are using a drop top guitar that you don't apply the heat for too long in any one spot. Now that we've shown you that little trick on how we can remove dents, we're finally ready to make some sawdust. 
There's a joke amongst luthiers that we spend like 90% of our time sanding. I think every tool in my shop is a piece of sanding equipment. On this job, for the curved edges of the body, we'll simply use flexible sheets of sandpaper in our fingers. For the top and bottom, because they're flat surfaces, we need sandpaper against some kind of hard backer. And in this case, we're gonna be using the dual action sander. If you don't have a dual action sander, you can use these pieces of foam that Stumac sells. You can also buy these at local hardware stores. You can just use scrap wood. It just has to be something flat. If you're using scrap wood, do make sure that you don't have any little tabs on it that can cause scratching, that's very important. And you can just use the adhesive back sandpaper, or you can just use any loose sandpaper and wrap it around it and hold it with your hand. Is there a reason why you wouldn't use your flat of your hand for, for this part? Yeah, if you use just your hand, the fatty part of your fingers end up digging into the wood a little bit more than other parts and you're gonna end up with a slightly wavy surface. The guitar neck is gonna be all hand sanding, using a hard backer for the flat edges and sandpaper in our fingers for the curves. Now let's get into the specifics of the sandpaper. First, the grit scale. Where you start is gonna depend on the quality of the wood that you're starting from. On a high quality kit like this, if you look at it and you think, man, this could just go straight into the paint booth right now, then you can probably start off with something like 220. And that's what we're gonna do here. If your instrument has little tool marks and deep sanding marks, you're gonna to wanna to start with something a little bit more coarse, like a 150 or a 180, and then work your way up. And if you have any really deep spots, you can get away with 80 grit, but it's really important to remember that those coarse sandpapers can really hog away a lot of material so you wanna be very, very careful with that. Regardless of where you start, we're gonna work our way up to 320 grit. Remember that we are not trying to make a smooth guitar, but what we're trying to do is to remove scratches. When it comes time to purchase your sandpaper, it's gonna be tempting to go with a cheaper route and save a little bit of money. It's super important that you don't do that. Make sure that your sandpaper has what's called a P-grit rating on it. When you're at your local hardware store, you can just pull the paper over and look at it and you'll see that letter P on there. And what that is is a grading process that the sandpaper goes through to ensure that it's nice and uniform. For example, this is a 220 grit hook and loop. That means that there's actually 220 little pieces of sand per square inch on this sandpaper. If this wasn't P-grit rated sandpaper, there could be an errant 150 grit little particle on there which can cause a big scratch. All of these papers, whether it's adhesive backed or the hook and loop stuff for your DA sander or even just these, these free papers, all have that P designation on them. Last and most importantly, safety. Sawdust is not good for the lungs. So get yourself a respirator. It can be just a paper filter that you can get your local hardware store. We use these nicer ones that have a rubber seal around them. They're not very expensive at all. They're very easy to breathe through. Once we get into the spraying portion of this project, we're gonna need chemically rated respirators. So if you're gonna buy one for that, you can also use it for this step as well. Okay, now that we've got everything we need, let's talk about technique. Whether you're using a dual action sander or sanding by hand, it's incredibly important that you sand with the grain, especially if you're hand sanding. If you look at this guitar that's in the white, you can actually see the grain lines on it going up and down the body. So what we want to do is with our sander or our sandpaper to go parallel with it in nice even patterns. We don't wanna be going this way because you're gonna have scratches that are incredibly difficult to remove. Also make sure that you're applying nice even pressure as you go. It's especially important if you're using a dual action sander that it's nice and flat planted, that it, you're not rocking in any one direction or another because you can dig into certain spots on it. And we also wanna make sure on this first part that we're just doing the top and the back and not trying to round it over on the edges. So with that, we're gonna give it to Matt and let him give it a try. Hold up a second. Matt, I noticed that you're sanding the horizontal part of the body first and then the diagonal slant second. Instead, you wanna make sure that you get nice and even smooth passes across the whole thing. So do the entire top in one single pass. The issue with when you do separate sections is that you can end up with this kind of like octagonal shape to it. All right, you ready? I got it. There you go. That's it, that's it. It's important that you're never sitting still in any one spot. Keeping fluid motion is going to give you a nice fluid finish on here.
So that looks a lot better. By letting the sander do the work, he ended up with a much smoother surface that has less of that octagonal shape to the edges. So that's step one. Now we need to go to step two, which is doing the sides of the guitar. This will be a theme that we talk about throughout this video series, but anytime you're working with rounded edges or corners, those spots on the guitar sand a lot faster. And we certainly would not want to be using something that has a flat face to sand a curved face. Instead, we're gonna tear off a piece of 220 grit and use our hands. You can also do this using the sandpaper that you used um, on your DA sander, you can just use your hand with that. But by folding it like this, now you've got sandpaper touching your hand and that gives you a little bit of grip on the backside where it's not gonna slide out of your hand. And then keeping my hand nice and flat on the guitar, once again, paying attention to grain direction. So we wanna make sure that we go this way. We don't wanna be going this way with it. As for the top and bottom, the end of the grain is actually popping out this way and it ends up being the stiffest part of the whole body. So you gotta be patient when it comes to working yourselves inside these horns. In terms of grain direction, just come around this way with it, even though the grain is running in this direction. So I'm gonna let Matt do this, and uh, I'm gonna inspect and tell him what he does wrong. <laughs> You're noticing like it's super hard to like hold the guitar and sand at the same time and you're like almost fighting against yourself. An important thing that can really make this a lot easier for you is doing some sort of work holding method. Back at our workshop, we use spray sticks. We actually have one of them. If you're doing a bolt-on style neck, you can just make one of these with just some scrap wood. They don't have to be fancy like we have here. All they do is fit inside the neck pocket and you can screw it in. And if you don't have one of these, you can put the guitar body directly into a vise as long as the vise has soft jaws on it or you could actually clamp the guitar very lightly to the workbench. Great, so what we have is a guitar that now we can hold really nice and solid. So let's get her into the vise here and try again. I'm sold. When sanding the sides, notice how Matt is using the flat sides of his fingers on the flat side of the edge and then rounds his hand to sand the curved edges, following the contours of the guitar to keep the natural shape intact. It's okay to take a few short, quick strokes if you need to, but overall stay in fluid motion and don't linger in any one spot. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there. It's just always best to flip it just so that you can see what you're doing. You don't wanna do very much of it blind. So that looks pretty good. Now let's address the horns. We just right. need to hold it here and then use two fingers to get around those edges. It's no fun, but there's no other way around it. <laughs> How's that looking? Oh, that looks pretty good. Yep, yep, yep. And just to do some in there. How long this prep sand takes is gonna depend on the species of wood that you're working on. The softer the wood, the shorter it usually takes. The older body that we're using is middle of the road. All right, I think that should do it. What's important now is to know whether or not you're ready to move on to the next grit, whether that in our case is 320 or if you're going from one of the lower grit papers up to the 220. Um, the way that we can do that is either by using one of these optimizers, which to me is just one of the coolest names. <laughs> and you can put that on and that's really gonna allow you to be able to look at this guitar and see whether there's still scratch marks that you need to remove. But the way that I recommend that you do it is by using a glancing light. This is a process of having a light in your room somewhere so that the light is actually gonna hit your guitar at an angle so that it creates shadows. So that you can see if there's any high spots, low spots, or scratches. You can use a cheap gooseneck light or a clamp-on reading light like we have here or even just a window. It just needs to be shining at an angle. It's amazing how much more detail I can see because each little scratch mark is a valley where there's a shadow now and it gives me the ability to really inspect my work. So with our glancing light on, we'll just go around the whole guitar. Make sure that your head is actually on this side of the light source. And what we're looking for is any scratches that are... They're deeper than the sandpaper, They're deeper right? than the yeah. sandpaper. You can use the shading as a way to tell. I notice a lot of the times where we have issues is inside the horn where there's chip outs because of the way that a router or CNC machine works. On this guitar, it looks really, really nice. And Matt did a good job of being very careful to keep it nice and smooth and it passes my test. So now you're gonna repeat the whole sanding process that we just showed you with the next grit up. Working your way up the scale, and in our case, that's the last grit, which is 320. So that looks really good. Let's get some 320 for the sides. I promptly ripped it. And again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Looks like a beaver cut that one. 
So this one's not gonna take very much work for you to do. Unless you sand the way you tear sandpaper. <laughs> I think we're about done. Just do a final full inspection on the guitar using our glancing light. Once you get through that 320 grit, everything should be smooth. I do want to point out that depending on the type of wood that you're using, you might have some marks on it that look like scratches. Trust your hand. If it feels perfectly smooth, it might end up just being like a, a dark spot inside the wood. So don't just sand because you see something. Sand because you see and feel something. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this looks fantastic, it feels smooth. Next, we need to get this completely cleaned off so we get rid of all the sawdust in preparation for doing the pour fill. And we do that by using some naphtha, which is a very mild chemical that you can use for doing finishing. Stumac sells it in these nice bottles here. Also is something that you can buy at a local hardware store. And we're gonna apply it to a shop towel. I'm gonna have Matt do it because he has the gloves on. This is gonna remove the dust as well as any oil from the wood. We haven't mentioned it yet, but just the oil from your hands or any oil that you might have on any tooling in your shop can really start to create adhesion issues with your finish when we get further on into the series. Make sure that the area that you're working in is away from any sort of lubricants or any oily tools. You're gonna wanna flip it, rotate it, apply more, constantly getting a new clean portion of the towel so that you're not just smearing sawdust around. As the liquid penetrates, it's gonna reveal any scratches that we may have missed. It looks really nice, so we have no issues there. Last, we're gonna wipe it down with a tack cloth. Basically, you need something that's just very, very lightly tacky that you're gonna gently wipe the guitar down with, and it's gonna remove any dust or lint particles. And tack cloths are available at your local hardware store. Or you can use a little trick that I used back in the military, and that is just use some lacquer and spray it on a cloth very lightly. Let it dry for just a few seconds, and then you can wipe it down with that. And that'll actually work as a makeshift tack cloth. Okay, this body is clean, dust-free, and once it dries, it's ready for some pore fill. Now let's prep the neck. Looking it over, this neck, as far as I'm concerned, is almost done. So we're gonna skip the 220 and go straight to 320. One thing I do wanna mention is, remember that this part of the neck, this, this area where it's gonna join the body, is incredibly important that you don't change the geometry of that whatsoever. If you were to get too crazy sanding, especially on this area, you're gonna affect that neck angle. And you also don't wanna take off too much meat off of the wood in this area because you can start affecting the geometry of it in this direction. All right, let's do this. I'm gonna use the foam block on all of the flat areas, sanding with the grain, being careful not to round over any edges. We have nice hard edges here on the headstock, and when we're doing all the hand sanding on this, just be very careful you don't round those over too much. It's really easy to not be paying attention. Come on, clean tear. Perfect. <laughs> When hand sanding necks, I find it easier to let my left hand do the rotating and my right hand to just stay in one spot. It just is a lot easier. We want to make sure that we're not getting any sandpaper or any marks on the frets. It's important that we keep that area untouched. If you have a two-tone neck like we do, you can accidentally drag sawdust into the crevice where the rosewood fretboard meets the maple neck. You're going to need to remove that with compressed air. It's that easy, like it was that quick. It doesn't take much work at all. Let's grab the naphtha so that we can get this thing nice and clean. That rosewood fretboard sometimes can want to bleed some of that sawdust onto the light colored maple. We didn't have any issues with that here, but it's something to pay attention to. Also wipe down the fretboard real quick with that naphtha. That looks really good. We're gonna let this dry for just a second and then we'll hit it with a tack cloth. All right, this neck is officially clean. If you have a maple fretboard along with a maple neck, you're lucky because you don't have to do anything at this point. You're just gonna spray the whole thing all at the same time, and so you can skip this next part. But in this case, we have a rosewood fretboard on this guitar, so we need to mask it off. I do recommend that you get the painter's tape and not masking tape, because when you go to pull it off, it's gonna be a nightmare. <laughs> it ends up breaking into little pieces and you have all kinds of trouble. But what I like to do is break off about a 12 inch piece of tape and then loosely line it up along the edge. Then down here on where the frets are closer together, I use a nut or a saddle, and I'll press the tape flush up against the edges of the fret on both sides so that they're completely sealed off. It's pretty straightforward. I know that this can seem annoying and time consuming, but trust me, it's worth it. It's gonna save us a bunch of work on the back sides, and you're gonna be thanking your future self. <laughs> Once we've gotten a little closer to the wider frets, we can switch over to a wider tool to do the pleating. We have just a small little three inch rule you can see 
tape kind of just hanging off the edge there. Don't worry about that. We're gonna address that here in just a minute. And if you get a tear in the tape like, like You that, can either just take a little piece of tape and stick it right on top of it. We wanna make sure that it's all completely sealed off. Yep, yep, yep. Cool. You wanna hold that tape up at an angle. Use just the leading edge like this, like that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And we're gonna do the same exact thing on the other side. So we have a little issue there of it pleating up. Mm -hmm. So you can just take it and tear that spot. And that happens sometimes, you get like wrinkles. You're gonna wanna remove said wrinkles. This is paint and stuff can get inside of there. All right, so this is a little trick that I learned back when I used to do sheet metal stuff in the military is instead of spending too much time with your razor blade, and we are gonna hit it with a razor blade really fast, but we're not gonna try to get it perfect with the razor blade. We'll just take some of the excess off around all the edges and then come back with a white foam block with 320 on it and do a pulling action down away from the fingerboard. We don't want to push because it's going to lift the masking tape, but we can just go like this. Kind of coming at little angles. And where do you see this? What you end up with is this beautiful thing where A, the fret end is dressed a little bit and the, it's sealed absolutely perfectly. So like a good example would be down here where we didn't even use the razor blade at all. If I take this and I just kind of round it over just a little bit, what you're gonna end up with is a nice little feathered section and that'll come right off now. Oh, that's awesome. And you end up with this beautiful, clean, crisp mm -hmm. line. So we'll have you do that one right here. You don't wanna be too aggressive with it. You don't wanna, obviously affect the geometry of the neck in any way. You're gonna to wanna to just follow the bevel of the frets on the guitar. Looks beautiful. So before we can call this completely finished, what we need to do now is mask off this section where the nut is gonna go on this guitar. Take a straight razor and cut to the headstock end of the nut slot so that it's protected a little bit. There we go. The main thing that you want to look for is that you have this beautiful seal all along the edges, making sure that you don't have any fuzziness that can happen from the sanding technique. Make sure that that's nice and clean. Masking tape is actually going to stay here for the duration of this entire project until we're ready to put strings on the guitar. That's another reason why you want to do a really good job with it. All right, you stuck with us this far, and this guitar in the white is completely done. So what we're gonna do now is we address what many of you people are probably coming to this video for, which is how do I refinish my guitar? Essentially, to prep this guitar for a new finish, we need to get the old finish off. There's two ways that you can go about doing this. One would be chemical stripping. We're not gonna cover it in this because it's not actually what I would recommend if this is your first time doing it. If you have plastic binding on your guitar, it can melt it. It can also burn through your nitrile gloves and burn your hands. It can really mess up your workbench, especially if you're not set up in a space where you have good ventilation. It's basically just strong acid in it, like a gelatin form. What I would recommend is doing a mechanical removal. Just sand it off. You wanna do this top and back if you can with a mechanical electric sander because it's gonna be a lot faster. You wanna start with either an 80 grit or a 120 and then work your way all the way up to about a 320 grit. Taking your time to just slowly remove the color until you just have a little bit of wood showing. The goal is to get as much of the old paint off while maintaining a flat and even surface. At some point, the visible wood fibers become prevalent and at that point you wanna stop. Those spots of paint are actually revealing little dings or low spots on the guitar. By stopping now, it allows us to use that paint as a natural filler, helping to create a nice flat surface that we're aiming for. Using hand sanding techniques, you're going to do the edges of the guitar, the cutaway, and the horns. Next, we'll use that glancing light to identify any remaining dents and use super glue to slowly fill in those low spots and then use accelerant to build those spots up so that it becomes very smooth again. And that's it. You're completely done with all of that prep work and you actually get to skip what we're gonna show next, which is the pour filling, because the old finish on the guitar actually acts as your pour fill. So lucky for you, you get to just skip forward to the vinyl sealing portion. But for the rest of you, pour filling. That's P-O-R-E. Just like the pores in your skin, wood has pores in it as well. And they kind of look the same, they're little dents that are in the wood where the cell structure has openings in it. Different species of wood have different pore sizes. Species with small pores are known as closed grain woods, maple, basswood, and cherry. 
they're all examples of closed grain woods. If you rub your hand across them or look at them, it's very, very smooth and you're not gonna see any pores. Species with large pores are known as open grain woods. And those include things like mahogany and ash and rosewoods. Those are pretty evident. You'll look at those and actually see the pores and the wood will feel rough. Then there are woods that fall somewhere in the middle, like this kit body that we're using today. This is an alder wood. As you probably guessed, if your guitar is one of those open grain woods, you're gonna to need to do a pore fill. And this is the absolute key to getting a glossy, perfectly smooth finish. So, if we use this whiteboard to visually represent the top of the guitar, this dip right here represents a pore. The thing about nitrocellulose finish, which is what we're gonna be applying here, that's important to know, is that the bulk of what's inside that can is what is called VOCs, volatile organic compounds. And those are the things that actually suspend the nitrocellulose inside the can. When you take your can and you spray it on a guitar, that smell that you smell that's so just like knocks you out, those are the VOCs. And what's happening during the drying process is the VOCs are evaporating, leaving behind the nitrocellulose finish. And by that process, the finish shrinks back. So if you don't fill your pores and you have open pores like this, the nitro finish is gonna shrink back into those pores. And you end up with visible marks on your guitar, all these little ridges, and it'll look good at first, but give it a couple of weeks. And then suddenly you're going, man, why does my guitar look like crap? So if we wanna prevent that from happening, we need to give that nitro finish a very stable surface to be applied to. To do that, we're going to very slowly, over the course of oftentimes several applications, add pore filling material into those pores until we get a nice, even, smooth surface so that as we apply our lacquer finish, no matter how much time passes, whether it's a couple days or a couple of years, as the finish shrinks back and becomes tighter and tighter adhered to the wood, that you get just a really nice, stable, smooth surface. This is a mahogany, remember, a very open pore wood that was pore filled with only one coat of pore fill, and I promise they felt really good about it. Sprayed the guitar, buffed out the guitar, and it looked good, but here we are with some time that has passed, and that nitro finish has actually shrunk back, and you get these visible finish marks where the finish has shrunk back into the pores. If you're looking to get a really smooth, glossy finish, this is not what we want it to look like. All right, so you'll remember this guitar from this kit is actually an alder wood, which falls right in between an open grain and a closed grain wood. In theory, we could probably get away with not doing a pore fill on it, but for the sake of this series, we wanna do it because we wanna show you guys how to do it, one. But two, we also wanna make sure that we get the highest quality finish as possible. And I wanna to recommend to you, if you are even a little bit confused on whether or not the wood of your guitar is open or closed cell, to just go ahead and do the pore fill because it doesn't hurt anything and it's only gonna give you a better product. Now the neck, on the other hand, is a maple neck and we're not gonna to need to do any pore filling on it because that's a closed grain wood. Now the fingerboard is open grain, but all we have is this slight visible line of Indian rose with there and if we want to you could put a little pore fill on that but we don't have to. Now there are a lot of ways to fill the grain in wood from the traditional ways which include things like using pumice or doing a French polish technique which I did for years and shellac which is a whole different subject or there's more modern ways that you can do it and those include three different categories water-based, oil-based, and then a two-part epoxy. There's pluses and minuses to each one. Water-based grain fillers and that's usually a powder that you would mix with water is easy to apply, easy to clean up, can go on just about any type of finish as well. It doesn't have to be just for nitrocellulose. The downside to using a water-based finish is that because it's water-based, it takes a lot of time to dry. It can take several days, especially if you're in a humid area like where me and Matt are from in Florida. Yeah. So if you don't wait long enough, you'll think you got a good pore fill, you'll do your lacquer, and then you'll get shrink back issues still. The second one, oil-based, is super similar except instead of being water and adhering it all together, you use oil. The downside is that it's really caustic, it smells bad, you could use gloves, it can be hard to clean up. And you, once again, if you don't let it dry long enough, especially in high humid environments, you're still gonna end up with shrink back. The third method, a two-part epoxy, is actually the method that I use on all of my electrics and my acoustic guitars. It is a little bit messy, but because it's chemically activated, you know that you're gonna get a full cure, and the shrink back on it is almost non-existent. It is a good product for us to use in this case because Matt and I have come here all the way from Florida. We have a limited amount of time that we're actually doing this series in, and we know that it's gonna give us a good result, and we're sure that it's gonna dry in time. For this series, we're gonna use a Z epoxy because it's not just any two-part epoxy will work for this. You need to make sure that you are using what is referred to as a finishing resin. Z epoxy comes in this 30-minute dry time as well as a 10-minute. 
Something else I would like to mention too is that if you mix up too much of it inside of a cup, you're gonna end up with a thermal runaway effect and it can actually heat up and cure super fast. So mix up as much as you think you'll need and not too much more because it'll actually dry quicker in the cup than it will on the guitar just because of that heat that it creates as it's curing. All right, with that, we are gonna get into this job. And what I really like about the Z-Poxy is that it doesn't require a whole lot of PPE. All we need is just some nice nitrile gloves. So we're gonna slap those on and it doesn't even have like a nasty smell or anything, which is really nice, especially if you're working at home and other people live with you. That's always a bonus, right? <laughs> All you need is just a tiny mixing cup like this. You can use anything really, remembering that it is gonna basically be trash after you're done, so don't do anything that's important. And then you need some sort of thing to stir it with, whether that's a scrap piece of wood, a popsicle stick. Uh, in this case, we have these little acid brush that we're just gonna turn upside down and use it to stir with. We're just going to do side-by-side -side pour into here, getting a nice 50-50 mix. Don't be concerned by the fact that this is amber. It's not gonna affect the color of the wood whatsoever. That's probably way more than enough. I'm gonna set those aside and begin mixing. You really wanna take your time and mix this really, really, really good. If you don't mix this up, boy, let me tell you, you're gonna apply your stuff and then keep coming back every hour wondering why your epoxy is not drying. And it's because you either A, didn't mix it up good enough or you have not gotten the correct 50-50 ratio. So take your time, mix it up really, really good. Okay, we are now going to use these spreaders that Stumac sells on this leading edge here is a slightly softer rubber and it contours to the wood. This side is a nice clean sharp edge that you can use to scrape. I swear by these things. You don't have to use this though. You can get away with using an old credit card or old gift cards. It just basically needs to be a nice flat item that is gonna give you a smooth uh, run across the wood without leaving any marks. You can even use at your local automotive store, we'll have like the spreaders for doing Bondo on cars. Those also work really well. When doing an epoxy pour fill, there's three steps to each round of application. Step one is to spread epoxy across the entire surface of the wood. So what we're gonna do is just slowly apply some epoxy down here. The thing about this first coat of pour fill is that the wood is going to really soak up a lot of this epoxy. But even with that, you don't need as much epoxy as you think that you do. I think the biggest mistake that people do on this is they apply too much. We are not adding a layer of epoxy to the guitar. We are only wanting to get the epoxy into the pores. Taking your time and doing this right here and applying the correct amount of epoxy is gonna save you a lot more sanding on the next step. If you have cavities, you always wanna fall into them not dragging the spreader across the top. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with just glops of dried epoxy down inside your pickup cavities, and it's just a mess. So we're just gonna work ourselves around here. We're gonna fall into this cavity, and then we're gonna fall into this cavity. Apply a little bit here. I'm not worrying about the edges of the guitar quite yet. So we have it on the guitar. Step two is to work the epoxy down into the pores. To do that, I'm gonna take my spreader, run perpendicular to the grain, and I run it 45 to the grain, and then I run it with the grain. You don't need to press hard. You can end up almost pushing down too hard, squeezing the epoxy into the pore, and then pulling it back out of the other side. So it's a ballet, paying attention to all of those different things, trying to not be in too much of a hurry. Another reason why I like to use this 30 minute um, Z epoxy, the 10 minute stuff, it can put you in so much of a hurry that you're just like, ah, and you're running around. Like knuckling it. Yeah, <laughs> and you end up doing a not good job because of it. The top looks really good. Step three is remove the excess epoxy. We wanna make sure that we're only getting the epoxy into the pour and that it's not just a, a huge thing of epoxy that's just sitting on top of here. Remember, that's what the lacquer's for. The epoxy pour fill is just to fill the pour. To do that, start with a clean spreader. Roll of paper towels is always good to have close by. And using the rubber side, if you have one, do nice even passes across the entire length of the guitar body, wiping off the excess epoxy after each pass. I'm only pulling off just the tiniest little bit here. Like there's basically almost nothing on that. And then here. 
It's also important to do these long, even passes to eliminate spots where like we've stopped and started and stopped and started and we've got these ridges because the stop and start points are hard to sand off. On the base side of a Stratocaster style body, you end up with this really thin area that there's nowhere that you can run a flat spreader on it. So I actually just end up taking some, putting it on my glove, use my finger just to get it in place and then we'll do the spreader to make sure that everything is smooth. That looks really nice. You should do this for a living. <laughs> so the back's a little easier. Be careful with this hand too. We got epoxy on the back side. All right. If we didn't have this spray stick that we were using to hold the guitar in the vise, we'd have to wait for it front to dry. Matt's doing something that is very common with beginners. You're going on pretty thick. Yeah. The important thing is that we know that we're going to need to squeegee off more. This area on a strat style kit, you end up with that plate that's gonna go on the back. You don't have to get it absolutely perfect, but also don't be afraid of getting epoxy like down inside the screw hole. You can fix this by just waiting for the pore field to dry and then re-drilling the holes. I'm gonna switch with Matt real fast. It's a little bit blotchy, which is probably where you guys are gonna struggle. What I recommend that you do is just apply a very small bead of epoxy to the length of the guitar. And then you're gonna take your spreader, a nice pressure, making sure that you don't have too much pressure on one side or the other. Do nice, even passes across the whole thing, constantly keeping a new clean spreader. We're gonna let that line of epoxy on the front end kind of do all the work for us across the whole thing. Any slight ridges, pull your glove nice and tight and hit it with your finger to knock it off. It's easier to do that now than to have to do it with sandpaper. Because the sides of a Strat style are kind of rounded, rounded and flat, I'm going to use my spreader just here in the flats use a smaller spreader if you've got one. It kind of squeegees itself out onto the sides and then you can take your finger and spread the stuff that's on the sides onto the guitar. This is where these spreaders, the Stumac cells come in handy because this soft rubber on the leading edge conforms to the shape. And the more epoxy you have into the wood, the easier this is gonna get. At first, it just wants to soak it all up. This whole process can seem tedious, right, and boring, but lacquer is really expensive and lacquer is really time consuming. Epoxy is not. If you do this job correctly, it's going to save you a lot of lacquer because if you don't do pore fill, guess what? That means you've got to probably apply like three to four times the amount of lacquer that you would if you did do a pore fill. And then you're going to end up sanding all of that lacquer off to basically be the pore filler for you. Especially if you've been doing finishes before and you've struggled, this is key. And if this is your first time doing a finish and you do it, you're going to think you're a genius because <laughs> when you see the end result, you're just going to be blown away because it just looks looks so good. It looks like the guitars that you've seen inside your music store. It's fine. Just bang it on the workbench. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna switch out gloves because it's getting super sticky and it's turning into a mess, so I'm just gonna switch them. You can see why the paper is important. <laughs> I'm gonna set this down. Um, we're not gonna have any issues with epoxy kind of rubbing off on here. I'm gonna pour some epoxy down in here. Remembering that this is end grain and it's gonna be thirsty. It's gonna soak up quite a bit. If there's anywhere on these guitars where you're gonna have issues with uh, defects in the wood or any sort of chip outs, it's gonna be in this spot. So you can let this epoxy do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. I'm just gonna apply a little bit more to the rounded areas and we'll call that one coat. If you're using a holding stick, make sure that you're not gluing this, the holding stick to your guitar with the epoxy. This epoxy is starting to cure up. You just feel it, it's gelatinous. But don't get in a hurry, just mix yourself up a new batch because it's when you get in a hurry that you start to mess up. Yeah, 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 I feel really good. Put it in the clamp. You can already see on the top of this guitar how much more relaxed it all looks. How do we know that the Z-poxy is dry, right? You'll wanna take some of that Z-poxy and bring it up the side of the cup so that it's a little thinner and then wait till that dries. And when this is dry, we know that is dry. The reason we bring it up the cup is because like I said, this section down here can have a little bit of a thermodynamic runaway effect. So it's not a true representation of when it's dry. You wanna have it so when it's thinner. Just something to think about, a little trick. So don't throw this away. It can become kind of a canary in a coal mine for you um, as you move along. All right, here we are six hours later. We've pulled the guitar off of the holding stick. 
and you can see that it's nice and dry. We also have our cup of epoxy over here that is nice and dry, is not moving, and a really nice safe method you can do to ensure that it's fully dry is you would take a straight razor, put a little bend in it, find a spot where the epoxy is just a little bit thick, and just drag it across there, and what you want is a nice powder to come off of there so that you know that it's fully dry because sometimes it can be dry to the touch, but the moment you put a razor on it, it's actually a little bit gummy. So let's talk for just a split second about what our goals are now. As it stands, we filled the pores, which is great. But we also have a very thin layer of pore fill across the surface of the wood. So the next step is to sand that layer off and just kiss the top of the surface of the wood so that we end up with a really nice flat surface. That's why we don't want just a whole bunch of pore fill stacked up, you know, an eighth inch thick on here because we need to sand that back off if that's the case. It's gonna save us a lot of time. We also need to be cautious not to over sand during this step and go all the way down to bare wood as well because then we gotta do that all over again. Now let's get to it. I'm using a 220 grit. Anything coarser than this is actually gonna create scratches that we then have to remove later on. And anything finer will take too long. Okay, before we flip it over and do the other side, that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, sanding it down till that we get, a lot of times the tell is just here on the very edges, you're gonna get just a little glint of light colored wood, which is that bare wood. The darker wood is the wood that has pore fill over the top of it. And we kind of want to strike that balance between the two. It's just getting into the bare wood, um, but still leaving the pore filler inside of it. So this looks really good. If you need to, you can use that glinting light method that we used earlier and look at it and see if you see any shiny spots. Shiny spots are the spots where the sandpaper hasn't hit it yet and we still have a low spot, so that might require a second coat. And on this guitar, it looks really, really nice. A big part of that is because it is that alder wood. So we'll do the back real quick. Okay, the back came out exactly the same way, especially you can see right here is just a slightly lighter color and around the edges, it's a slightly lighter color, but we did that nice balancing act. And while I was at it, I went ahead and took my power sander and did just the flat areas, um, just cause it's a little bit quicker, especially this spot here where the neck attaches, that can be sometimes hard to do by hand. But now we'll just switch over to just loose papers and we're gonna just hit these edges up, knocking down any high spots of the epoxy, following that balancing act between getting down to the bare wood and still leaving epoxy pore filler. But while we have Matt here not doing anything as usual, <laughs> we're gonna have, we're gonna have him do the sanding around the edges. Well, you get what you pay for. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this time we're using hook and loop sandpaper. So Matt has done this before, obviously, like I'd mentioned, so he knows what to look for, but uh, these edges and these round parts are the parts that sand way faster, so just be careful you don't take off too much. And the spots on the end grain of the guitar is where that epoxy most likely got soaked really deeply into the wood. So it's actually not gonna require very much sanding at all because it's, it's thirsty and probably soaked up most of that. You can see that it's actually going a lot quicker here than it did when he was doing uh, the initial prep sanding. And that's pretty typical. So if you see dark spots where it's just pore fill there, those are spots you still need to hit. It just makes it easy to keep track of where you are. As you get around that neck pocket area, just be very, very careful with the sandpaper. We don't want to be changing the geometry of any of that because you're going to end up with sloppy looking joints. So always be mindful of any sort of structural things that you don't want to change on your guitar. Oh, almost there. Am I missing anything? No, I think it looks really nice. Thanks, man. Yep, yep, yep. Let's sit there. Looks nice to me. Is that, is that a little bit right there? 
see. See, this is where that glinting light is important. I can get it over here and kind of hold it up and see. And it is very slightly shiny right here, which tells there me that this spot hasn't been hit. Yeah, it's hard to see in the direct light like this. So mm -hmm. you get it over here and look at it and you can really see that shiny spot. So yeah, we'll just hit a little bit right there. Yeah. Let me take a look at her for you. Yeah, it's, uh, this looks really nice. Um, I mentioned earlier trusting your hand, and I think this is another one of those situations. Sometimes I won't even look at the guitar. I will just clearly rub my hand across it, and it's gonna tell me, like I'm not even looking at it. There's a spot right here you missed, and you can just feel it. There's a dent, there's like a, a raised Oh, spot. sure enough, yeah. And it's just epoxy. And visually, I almost wouldn't have even seen that. So we can just hit that really quick. Just get that nice and smoothed out. But do that first, and then we're gonna use the glancing light method and look to see if we see any shiny spots. If you look at your guitar and there's all kinds of even spots all over the whole thing where you see little glints of light, that's the pores still being too low. What you have in a situation like that is basically that. The pore filler is not raised up to a nice level place. So what you're gonna need to do is apply a second and possibly even a third coat. This guitar looks really good and we're not gonna apply a second coat. We're just gonna get away with just the first one. I wanna caution you though, we're able to get away with that because of the species of wood that this is. If you're using mahogany, the pores are very, very open and soak up a lot more of the epoxy. And it's gonna require more pore filling. If you have even the slightest doubt with it, apply a second and possibly even third coat. I've gone as far as doing four and five coats of pore fill, especially if I was on a time crunch and I had situations where I needed the finish to be perfect out of the box and I've got a short amount of time do the pore fills. You're gonna feel rewarded in a few steps, I promise you. As soon as you get to start spraying the finish and it looks beautiful and perfectly smooth, you're gonna be, I'm so glad I took the time to do that pore fill. So with that, all we need to do is just get this guitar cleaned up so that we can begin doing the vinyl sealing process. If you guys are refinishing the guitar, you're now caught up with us. At this point, you're gonna follow along right with us and follow all the steps that we have because you can see now, I think, how the finish that used to be on your guitar that you've sanded off, you've basically taken it to the point that we are now. Now. So happy to join you and happy to have you and uh, we'll, we'll all go forward and make a beautiful guitar with, from this point forward. <laughs> now we're getting to the really fun part of this project where we're actually going to begin to start spraying things on the guitar body and we're going to start off by using what we call a sealer coat which is as you guessed it is designed to seal the wood and it's going to create a barrier between the color coats and the clear coat and the wood. We do this to create a solid surface for the color and clear coats to adhere to that's impenetrable so that we can get the smooth, uniform finish that we're going for. If we don't apply this, what ends up happening, especially when we start applying color, is certain parts of the wood are gonna drink up that color more than other parts, and you're gonna end up with a very blotchy look and end up chasing your tail as you spray this guitar, wondering why it doesn't look good. So it's very important that we spray this. Don't think of it as a clear coat. Think of it as a primer coat. Those of you who are joining us doing a refinish project, doing the seal coat is especially important for you. Your guitar actually does look pretty blotchy. So we have to spray that seal coat so that we get a very smooth and even look as we apply the color coats moving forward. With that, let's talk about the kit guitar and where we stand on it. The last thing that we did is we had Matt do the masking off of the fretboard and we're ready to spray it now finally. But guess what, we have a problem. The VOCs that are in these aerosol cans is very, very dangerous and horrible for you. So we can't spray them inside. Good ventilation is absolutely the top priority thing that we need to deal with. And for those of you thinking, oh, I'll just do it outside, because that's what we all think. We have to think about things like wind and humidity and temperature. The last thing that you want is you spray your coat and it's looking good, and then a giant gnat flies right into it and sticks to it. Back at our workshop in Florida, we actually have a full dedicated paint booth. It's about 10 foot long by six foot wide with good intake and exhaust fans that are all explosion proof, including all of the lighting. It took several months for me to put all this together and cost quite a bit of money. But for those of you at home, you might be thinking, well, I don't have a full dedicated paint booth and I certainly don't wanna build one just for this one project. The good news is there's a lot of really good and elegant solutions that you can have a good temporary paint booth set up. A nice easy thing to do is just type in temporary paint booth online and you're gonna find that there's a lot of solutions there. And I know for me personally, I actually early on in my career bought this book that Max sells, Guitar Finishing Step by Step. I still use it occasionally and I recommend it to folks all the time as a way to get into guitar finishing. Well, there's a section in this book that talks about ways that we can safely spray aerosols and do it right there at home without a lot of cost and commitment. And it's actually written by a local legend, Mr. Dan Erlewine, here in Athens. And this is Matt and I's first time here. And we thought, 
Well, wouldn't it be cool to go give Dan a visit? Absolutely. See what he has to say about how we can achieve a nice temporary solution for those of you at home. Come in. Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm good, I'm Dan. Chris. Hi, Chris. It's so good to meet you. Hey, Matt. Welcome to Athens. Thanks for having us. I'm excited because I know you guys do an aerosol course. Yeah, we've been shooting for a little while now, yeah. And always have been into aerosols. This is what happens in about a year, right? Definitely not enough in yeah. it, not enough in it. Cabinets full of half-empty spray cans. Yeah. We heard that you have a nice little setup that is kind of like an in-between of a permanent paint booth and a temporary paint booth. That's my fancy spray booth over Let's check here. check it out. Oh, I love it. It's an 18 inch, totally enclosed exhaust fan from Granger. Oh, super nice. Nice, yeah. It's louvered. It's not an explosion proof. It's a decent exhaust fan. I put a magnet just on the cage to hold my filters. I'll show you. Hers pulls it right out. It's yeah. out, it's out. And I think that that's something that a lot of people think is that it, you either go all out or you have nothing. And this seems like a really nice compromise. If I was gonna spray a whole guitar, which I haven't in this, this particular shop yet, I'm probably put some Visqueen up on the sidewalls sure. just because it would, might get pretty covered sure. with lacquer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Then you, then you can yeah. close it up uh, when you're not using it. Repair magnets. Hi. I love me a magnet. We love some, yeah. <laughs> That's a trade secret. That's beautiful. When I first made it, it was a box like that. And then I realized if I did this, yeah. yeah. Super cool. But it has a little hole in it. Yeah, I was wondering what this is for. In the wintertime, I could, I'll mix epoxy underneath here, just turn it on just to keep the fumes out. Nice. Come on. Nice. Even somebody like Dan, who's it's kind of a big deal, <laughs> gets away with just using a, what works for the job. You just want to have a good ventilation. Right, yeah, right. Exactly. You don't want to get a fire. So are you guys doing an acoustic or an electric? What are you spraying? It's a Strat style kit that we're doing a, a sonic blue finish yeah. on and we're trying to teach everybody how to go from just bare wood all the way up to like a factory quality finish using their aerosol system. It can be done, I it believe. Can, it can absolutely be. If we get it finished up, would you maybe grace us and like come oh, by and, and, and tell us, sure tell us, tell us what you think? You yeah. couldn't keep you'll, me you'll be honest, you'll be I honest, right? To. Yeah, don't hold back. I, I might bring down a can of red paint. There we go. <laughs> come on, yeah. <laughs> Put a sunburst on that. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> it's so cool, man. Yeah, thanks so much for having us, yeah. man. If you have time this week and we can all get together or something. Perfect. That was super cool for me to go meet Dan in person oh, and totally. check out his, his workshop. I mean, I've been looking at it on screen for years, but most importantly, what I think is really fascinating is to see that even somebody who works at the level that Dan does is able to get by with a paint booth that just does what it needs to do. And it should be inspiring to you at home to realize that you don't need a full paint booth. But we're lucky because here at Stumac, the wonderful folks have provided us with an inflatable paint booth that's actually up on the roof of the building here. And I'm really excited to try this thing out. But first, let's talk about vinyl sealers. When it comes to choosing the exact product that you're gonna be using for your project, what I wanna emphasize is that you need to stick within that same brand's product line. The worst thing that can happen, and I see happen all too often, is that somebody will start using one brand's vinyl sealer and then another brand's color and then another brand's lacquer clear coat, and what ends up happening is that you have some incompatibility in there chemically and you'll end up with this, these artifacts that happen on the finish and you're gonna have to start completely over. So right out of the gate, find a company that you trust and a product line that has everything that you need from start to finish so that you don't have those issues. Now in this particular series, we are actually gonna use this Color Tone line of products because Color Tone is compatible for instruments specifically and you might think, Lacquer's lacquer. Well, it's not. A really good instrument lacquer is gonna allow a certain level of flexibility so that we don't lose the tonality of the instrument. We don't want it to be so stiff that it actually changes the tone of our guitar. It's also designed to be uh, you know, used in different environments where it might be more humid or more cold. It's gonna be more crack resistant. And so it's just a fantastic product that we know is gonna work well. The cool thing about them too is that the color line includes some of the most popular colors in the guitar world, so you don't have to worry about it being just slightly different than what you expected. They also sell everything from the vinyl sealer through the lacquer so that we know that we're gonna be successful. Before we head up to the roof and actually start spraying some of this product, I wanna make a couple of notes on ways that you can improve your level of success. I come from a world where I've always sprayed with actual HVLP guns. Well, the reason that we use those in a professional setting is because they give us a lot of control. We can control the amount of air pressure and the amount of fluid that's coming out of the gun, which gives us the ability to dial in the exact look that we're going for. 
Well, we don't have the luxury of that with an aerosol can, but the good news is there's a couple of things that you can do to really improve the amount of control that you have with this. And one of them is actually heating up the cans. Before you spray, fill yourself up either a bowl or a bucket or your sink with hot water. I know for me that I find that the sweet spot's around 150 degrees. And I do recommend it to use some sort of thermometer because we don't want to make them too hot. You're going to want to submerge them to the point where you don't actually have the spray nozzle covered in water because that can create its own set of issues. And let them soak for about 15 to 20 minutes before you spray. It's night and day the difference. What it does is increases the pressure inside the can and it actually increases the viscosity of the fluids and just greatly improves the amount of atomization of the fluid as it comes out of the tip and you get much better flow. That in combination with upgrading the actual nozzle that you use, and Stumac does sell these and they're fantastic, you're gonna get beautiful atomization. The other thing that these spray nozzles do is they actually give you the control of whether you're spraying horizontally or vertically. With those two upgrades to a simple aerosol can, in my experience in doing this, it's a complete and utter game changer. All right, we're up here on the roof of Stumac, and before we step into the super awesome inflatable paint booth that they have over here, the first thing that I wanna do is show you why we wanna preheat those cans and upgrade the nozzle. So we're gonna have Matt actually hold this up for us, and we are outside and have good ventilation. So I don't have to wear a respirator for this part. The wind is blowing this way, so we're not gonna be getting it in Matt's face, but we'll have Matt hold it up. And once again, this is the can that uh, is at room temperature and has the factory nozzle on it. So we'll do that, and I'm actually gonna do a little spot right there. And you can see all the little blotches that are inside of it. The droplets that are coming out of this are much larger, and it can create issues with orange peel and just kind of blotchiness as a look. And now what I'm gonna do is do a pass with a heated up can with an upgraded nozzle on it. And what you're gonna see is it's just a much more uniform look because the this paint as it comes out of the gun is just a much more finely atomized. And then I'll do another quick spray right there. Especially here, you can see how fine it is. It has much more of an airbrush look to it and that's gonna let you be a lot more successful. So. Let's talk about technique. What you don't wanna do is just grab your can and start slinging paint all over the guitar because you're gonna end up with a blotchy mess. It's important that you have your feet nicely planted and you've got a good solid foundation and keeping it parallel with the surface of the guitar, do nice even passes about 12 to 18 inches away at a nice even speed, doing 50% overlaps of each pass. Don't do just pendulum swings like this where you're doing an arc because what ends up happening is you're far away from the product and then you're getting close to it and then you're far away from it again and that's going to create hot spots here in the middle. The other thing that you want to make sure that you do is that you start your spray off of the guitar, pass all the way across and then release the nozzle off of the guitar as well. You don't want to be stopping and starting on top of the guitar because you're going to get heavy spots if you do that. And I do find that it's very useful just to have a little bit of brown packing paper close by to test out your spraying because it really is going to show you what it looks like and you don't have to waste paint on your guitar. Keep a conscious count going on inside your head and get a nice rhythm going as you do it. I wasn't going too fast, wasn't going too slow. You can actually see the marks here where we have that nice 50% overlap and we have a nice consistent look. What I'll do is something wrong here. I'm gonna start and stop on top of the guitar and I think you're gonna get a good idea of why you don't wanna do that. Which you can see here is a heavy spot and a heavy spot here. And if you were to do that, especially on your color coats, you're gonna be really likely to have a blotchy look that you're not happy with. So once again, keeping nice even passes is gonna give you a consistent even finish as we slowly build it up. What we're not looking to do is to get anything done in any one coat. This is gonna be a multi-coat process and we're gonna slowly get to the end line. We're not gonna get there in one step. So you about ready to do this, Matt? <laughs> Let's go do it. <laughs> All right, so we're here in this awesome paint booth and we have our guitar hung up. But before we spray our very first coat of sealer, use your tack cloth and give it a quick wipe down really, really fast. We don't want to start off with particles of dust inside of it. And I'm just going to let it rip. We're going to do the whole thing. I'm actually going to rotate the nozzle on here so that we can begin doing passes in the vertical position. The cutaway areas on the Strat style guitar, those can be a little bit more complicated. It's just little short spritzes to get it in there. It's really easy to build up too much finish and create sags in that area. So just take your time. Don't get too crazy with it.
Now that we have our first coat of vinyl sealer successfully applied to the guitar body, let's spray the neck. All right, we got that first coat of vinyl sealer on there successfully. So let's talk about what we need to think about now. We're gonna do two to three coats of vinyl sealer total. So now that we have that first one on there, we wanna wait a minimum of one hour before we put that next coat on. I'd like to get the next one on with a maximum of three hours of time. So for us, it's lunchtime. And what I do recommend for you is that you don't stay staring at this guitar waiting for it to dry. Go find something to occupy yourself so that you don't have a tendency to apply the next coat too early. So we're gonna go grab some food. All right, we've successfully sprayed the three coats on here yesterday, and we've let it dry overnight, and that's what I would highly recommend to you, is let it go overnight so that we can ensure that it's fully dry before we do this next step. It's gonna be important that you remain patient, and that's a way to ensure it. And what you're gonna end up with is something that looks like this. What you should see is a very nice uniform, kind of a matte finish on the guitar, and there aren't any spots where you can clearly see that the vinyl sealer has soaked into the wood over here, and it's sitting on top over here. You don't have any runs or sags, and if you have that, you're on track. It looks really good, and the neck looks good, Matt? Yeah, looks, looks really great. good. Okay, so now what we need to do, before we can apply color, because that's what we're all here for, right, is to do what I call a knockdown sanding coat, and we're gonna do this many times throughout the process, and it's not the same as we have done before where we're just kind of hogging away wood and we're trying to create a, a surface for, for paint to adhere to. What we're trying to do here is just knock down those little bitty specks of dust. Because if I rub my hand on here, like right here, there's one little spot where there's a piece of dust sitting inside of it. And I don't care how good your paint booth is, that's going to happen. So I'm going to give Matt some of this 400 grit sandpaper. This is the adhesive back stuff and it works well for this. All we're going to do is very lightly, almost with no pressure whatsoever, and letting it float across the surface knock down the finish just to get rid of any hairs or dust that are inside of it and give us a nice smooth surface for the color to go on top of. Should just get a nice little dust coat on top. And you almost don't even have to be concerned about grain direction or anything while you do this. I'm actually going to pull the sandpaper off and do like Matt is and do the sides by hand as well. This is something that I often don't see in instruction books, but it's something I picked up over the years that really just kind of makes sure that you're gonna be successful down the road. And it just saves you some trouble as you move along with the, the, the paint process. Is that looking good? It's good, yeah. Should this be smooth? That's what you're sh shooting for, is this, you don't feel any um, dust particles or anything. Inside. Right, no weird it, lumps. Yeah. It's funny, I have a tendency to think that maybe you could use steel wool, but the problem is, is that leaves steel wool particles. So definitely <laughs> use just sandpaper on this. <laughs> and then what we're gonna do after you have done that is wipe it down with a tack cloth, get it nice and clean again, because obviously now we've introduced all this dust. And then for this body, we're gonna have to put it back on the spray stick so that we can spray those color coats. But we'll do that and call this step complete. All right, now we get to stand back and admire all the work that we've done up to this point. We've packed so much in to this episode, at least two days worth of work. And next episode, we're actually gonna be applying the color coat and you can check that out by clicking on the link that we put right here. And we'll see you guys in the next one.